Good morning, everyone. Thank you for your patience um, in us getting up and running this morning. We have about twice as many folks on the line than what we anticipated. Um, the number keeps rising and we're at over 700. So please be where, be bear with us as we um, navigate a really large population of folks. Um, today we are providing you as a division um, an update regarding coronavirus information, um, how that's playing out and what we have available to offer. We have several folks that are participating today and we will ask, I'll ask them to introduce themselves as they each present information. You received an email ahead of time and when the email blast went out and we asked for questions, if you had questions prior that wanted to be submitted, that you wanted to submit, we would address those. So we do have those in hand. We also encourage you to submit questions during this webinar. I'm not sure that time will allow us to address those immediately, but we will still circle around and make sure that your questions are addressed. So with that, I am going to turn that over to our first presenter today. Good morning, everybody. This is Wendy Witzig, a Deputy Division oh. Director. And I first wanted to walk you through our new website page. So this is where we are going to be storing all the information that we put out, the bulletins, guidance, that we put out from the division will be under the DD operation specific guidance. So, sorry, I'm a little winded. Um, so that's where we will be uploading that. Please check that throughout the day. We will be putting information on there. And at the end of each day, there will be an email blast that comes out that will list all the new guidance that's been added and any updated guidance that we've made changes to. So that will help to keep you abreast of what's going on and hopefully reduce the number of emails that you're getting throughout the day and keep it down to just hopefully that one from us. So please use this as your source of reference for anything to be current on what is going on in DD and it will be growing. We're running as fast as we can in literal senses too sometimes um, about adding guidance and getting you the information that we have. But we are building this plane as we're flying it so my apologies to state staff that are out there and families and providers who um, are getting, everybody's getting information at the same time. So if you read something and you talk to your support coordinator about it and they're not familiar with it, um, I'm not surprised about that. Just give everybody a minute to kind of catch up and we'll do our best with that and work through this. Um, there's another tab there where you, we will be adding guidance. Um, at the department and state level from OA or from Department of Health, and there's links there as well that will be helpful to get you um, the authorities there on information that's coming out. So just keep this um, website bookmarked for yourself and your staff and keep abreast of that. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Becky Geyer, who is going to give us an update on um, Missouri State in terms of the, the virus and talk a little bit about our PPE needs, our protective equipment needs. Thanks, Wendy. This is Becky Gear. I am the Director of Continuity of Operations for uh, the Department of Mental Health. And just to kind of start us off, I wanted to give you a, a quick update of where we are. As of this morning, we have 28 cases of COVID-19 in Missouri. Uh, in a country, in the United States itself, we have over 14,000 cases at this time with over 205 deaths. This does change rapidly. It, the situation is evolving quickly. So I would just echo what Wendy said in making sure that we are just aware of that, that information is constantly changing. To talk about PPE, personal protective equipment, I wanted to let you know that as the department, we are submitting a six, over $6 million request for personal protective equipment. However, with that said, that does not mean we are going to get $6 million in personal protective equipment. We are doing everything we can to advocate for the PPE purchases for our facilities and community providers, but we know um, we have a demand just like many people in our state and in fact in our country at this time. There is a SNS, Strategic National Stockpile System, that has PPE that is able, we are able to access, but the first round we know will go to law enforcement and those first responders, but we are working hand in hand with the State Emergency Management Agency to get PPE out to our folks. So with that said, 
Um, I know there's a lot of concern about the lack of PPE, and so I just want to talk to you guys a little bit about conserving the PPE that you have, what that may look like, um, how we don't use it unless we need it type of situations. Specifically, the CDC has some guidance out there for healthcare professionals, and it's really good guidance. Um, I printed out a couple to bring with me today to highlight, but specifically thinking about face masks and gowns. You can also find information out there on N95 respirators and eye protection. But when we are thinking about gowns and isolation, or isolation gowns and face masks, we also need to think about other ways that we can, or other means we can use if we don't have access to this. So on the uh, CDC site specifically, let's talk about face masks first. It talks about if no face masks masks are available, what are our options? And they talk about being able to use a face shield, something that will cover your entire face. Uh, they talk about utilizing handmade things like scarves. Uh, on here specifically it says, in settings where face masks are not available, you might consider using homemade masks like a bandana or a scarf for care of patients with COVID-19 as a last resort. And I do wanna highlight it says patients with COVID-19. Um, so specifically thinking about that. On the gowns, some of the things that ask you to do is to think about how you are utilizing the gowns. Are you specifically utilizing them in only isolation situations or are you utilizing them on a daily basis? I, I think at this point with the shortage in gowns, we know that it's probably better to only use them in isolation situations. And if you get into a situation where you need to isolate somebody and you don't have gowns, there is guidance on the CDC website for things you can do, like um, some of the stuff they list on here is using, if there's absolutely no gowns, using disposable lab coats, um, disposable aprons, reusable washable lab coats, uh, washable patient gowns, so different ideas on here. So I think that would be uh, a good piece of information for you all to check out. A couple other things to hit on. Um, I know many of you actually purchase your personal protective equipment or your cleaning supplies actually at the store rather than placing orders. So I would encourage you, right now there's a real shortage of things like toilet paper and cleaning supplies at the stores. The stores, a lot of them have gone to stocking overnight and cleaning overnight and then putting things out as they go so that first thing in the morning there may be more supplies than in the evening. So I would encourage you to look at the stores first thing in the morning. Um, maybe if you're out on the weekend and you're shopping for yourself personally and you come across a newly stocked area of stuff that you know your agency needs, I would encourage you to pick it up right then and there. We'll worry about reimbursement later. Last thing I would really like to hit on is just requests for PPE. Um, we need to be going through our local healthcare coalitions. That information has been pushed out, I believe. Um, and you should be requesting through the process. There's a form that you are going to request through with your local healthcare coalition. We're actually okay, so a couple, I, I stand corrected. I'm sorry. There's a couple pro providers that are testing that. We're going to make sure that works. Um, I, I think at this point with the shortage, I would encourage you to request it any route you can get. So if you can go through, if that works with the local healthcare coalition, then that's the route we should definitely go through in addition to making sure we know at the department what the needs are and we will just try to cover it from all routes possible. That's all I have. Okay. I'm gonna turn it over to the next speaker. Hey, good morning, this is Angie Brenner and I'm with our Federal Programs Unit in the division. Um, I'm gonna bring to you a few announcements from MoHealthNet that came out and from social services that came out yesterday. Um, so really, I'll just kind of go through these here. With the Federal Families, consistent with the Federal Families First Coronavirus Response Act, effective immediately, Department of Social Services will not be terminating for any, any medic will not be terminating eligibility for any Medicaid participant unless that individual requests a voluntary termination of their eligibility or if the individual ceases to be a resident of the state through the end of the federal emergency, the COVID-19 declaration. 
Social Services is also extending 90 days of the MoHealth Net coverage to Missourians ages 19 through 64 who test positive for COVID-19 and meet the income and resource eligibility guidelines. MoHealthNet is relaxing requirements related to prescription refills and prior authorizations to ensure participants have access to the essential medications. And then we have the Missouri uh, Medicaid Audit and Compliance, U Compliance Unit, and they're expediting new provider enrollment applications, and they're waiving certain enrollment requirements such as application fees and on-site visits to enable providers to serve Medicaid participants quickly. During the COVID-19 pandemic, MoHealthNet providers can also use telehealth services or other alternative methods such as Skype or FaceTime to provide services to the MoHealthNet participants at their homes. And this will include our waiver participants that we serve. MoHealthNet is also waiving the requirement that physicians must have an established relationship with the patient before providing services through telehealth and waiving the copayment for any services provided by means of telehealth during this COVID-19 event. There have been some updates for the Food Stamp Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program called SNAP. Family Support Division is waiving all work requirements for able-bodied adults without dependents for 90 days. And then with Child Care Subsidy Program, Child Care Subsidy benefits are extended for 90 days. The Child Care Subsidy Program will work on a case-by-case -case basis to approve additional hours of care for families affected by COVID-19. And the child care subsidy provider application renewals will be extended for 90, 90 days. Um, currently, the Department of Social Service and Family Support Division have requested waivers from the United States Department of Agriculture, Food Stamps, Food and Nutrition Services to waive all food stamp adverse action notices for 90 days, to waive initial in-person food stamp interviews for 90 days, and to extend food stamp certification periods by 12 months. And then you may have also seen some guidance come out from Family um, Support Division yesterday about options for customers to email or fax their applications for verification and other documentation is needed. This guidance, they wanted us to follow up. This guidance is, is really beneficial for the public, but for our providers that currently work in the system, continue to send all of your communication to Family Support in the established ways that you've been using. Um, if you end up sending information to the newly created fax or email that was provided in the, the news release yesterday, it could lead to delays in processing because it's gonna go to, to them through all the general public information. So again, use your current channels that you're using for Family Support Division. So you can see that MoHealthNet, Social Services, Family Support Division, they're all making a lot of changes in response and they're, we're trying to respond quickly and we're doing the same thing here at our division and so we are working on um, federal waiving requesting federal authority authority waivers for our various requirements and you'll see a lot of that on the website that we have we want everyone to know that that when we request this waiver through the federal government we are going to ask for backdating so continue to follow the guidance that we're sending out go ahead and do it even though we don't have it submitted to the federal government yet, they are allowing us to backdate. They really want us to continue moving and they'll support us with that. And I think with that, we'll start going through some of the, the guidelines that we sent out last night. Okay, so there is a letter that is, um, some of you, is going out for distribution now. Uh, so some of you may have gotten it a little earlier this morning and we're posting it to the website. Um, and it should be showing up there for you pretty soon. But this is the letter and the guidance that we're gonna go through. It speaks to a lot of the questions that have been coming in. And so then we'll also try to insert um, answers to some of the questions that are, are related but maybe don't speak directly in here as we go through. So one of the first things that in order to um, really support the, the social distancing and those protective measures, we are um, modifying our face-to-face -face requirements for all waiver services except for transportation and environmental modifications to allow delivery by telephone, video, text, email, if practical and necessary. So this will include, but it's not limited to support coordination monitoring, ISP meetings and QE oversight. Some of our monitoring activities are actually being suspended and we'll speak to those a little later um, in this conversation and they are referenced in the document um, a little further down as well if you're following in the document. 
So I want to really note here that the, these suspensions of, of these activities does not waive your responsibility within the function of that, of, of that role. So you still have documentation requirements. If, if you're a support coordinator, the monitoring guidelines still apply. If, you're, if it's monthly monitoring, then you need to be making that phone contact or email or um, video chat monthly. So all of those things still apply. We are just creating flexibility um, within how we're delivering some of these things and how we're going about monitoring some of these in the time being. So for many things, we at, at the end of this emergency, we will have to go back and make sure that we come into compliance with anything that we are currently waiving. So keep that in mind. If your operations allow you to continue with the current practice, we highly encourage you to continue with any current practice. But um, if not, and if you can't, and don't interrupt your continuity of care, we, we will just have to go back and come into compliance with um, our waiver standards at, at a later date after we get through this emergency. So that speaks to some face-to-face, -face, and then Kim is going to add in some information that has come in and requested about nursing. Yes, so good morning, everyone. This is Kim Stock with the Department of Quality. I want to share with you just to highlight, we had a few questions that came in specifically around RN oversight that's provided as a component of our residential services and supports with our contracted providers. As Angie and Wendy alluded to earlier, with the ability to expand how we're currently delivering services, the nurses will have, using their professional judgment, the ability to utilize those telehealth resources. We have already posted guidance out on the COVID-19 website within the division that speaks specifically to the RN oversight. So I would strongly recommend that um, if you have interest in this particular subject that you go out and you look at that information. Okay, so as, as Wendy and, and Kim have both mentioned, we are expanding telehealth to provide traditional face-to-face -face services when practical. And we really encourage providers to be innovative um, in providing your ABA services, your applied behavior analysis services, personal care assistance, day program, employment, and, and other services. And again, for those telehealth, we can look at ways as Wendy mentioned, by telephone, video, text, email, um, just make sure you've got your documentation and it's noted that it's, it's done via telehealth. And some of those um, service areas are, are seem unusual to be able to do by telehealth. So we're allowing you to be creative, but it's not, but it still has to be practical, be applicable and um, be of benefit to the individual. Otherwise, we need to find another a way to provide that service. So talking a little bit more about some flexibilities that we're putting in place is we're expanding group home, ISL, and shared living setting sites in, or in order to help um, providers manage the number of people that are in a home and also to in improve the continuity of care that you're able to provide. So family or agency staff may live at the residence in order to reduce the number of people in and out of the home. So you can have live in, a live-in caregiver. Um, family members would have to become employees of the agency. If the agency plans on billing for the service and paying the family member, the family members would have to become employees of the agency and they would be, um, have to go through a background check through Family Care Safety Registry. Additionally, anybody that lives in the home that's 18 years of age or older would have to go through that background check. But if, so let's just clarify one thing. If, if a family wants to take their um, child home to live with them during this time and there's going to be no payment involved of that family member, then um, there would be no billing for that service and they would just go home. It's only if that family member is going to get paid for the service and the agency is going to then bill that as a residential service, whatever residential service they were providing, um, they will continue to bill that as a residential service and, and follow that guidance. Um, individuals currently living in group homes or ISLs may go home to live with the family or legally responsible party or an agency staff as a way to reduce the number of people in the residence and to provide staff continuity. Um, Individuals currently in a shared living arrangement may also move in with a family member or a legally responsible party 
or or transition to another staff member if the staff that is providing that shared living support becomes ill and unable to provide for their care. Um, we are expanding day habilitation setting. So we are allowing day habilitation staff to provide day habilitation in the residential settings. So if you have a day program that is closing down, you can work with the residential provider and a day program staff can go to the residential site and provide that support without becoming an employee of the residential provider. The day program agency would continue to bill um, day habilitation service. That will prevent anything from having to go through UR in terms of approval and it will also help maintain um, the revenue stream for that day program provider. Um, should that and, and also help the residential provider with additional staffing. So that is an option. It can also be provided in the family's home. So if the individual is living at home with family, the day program provider can be deployed to work with the individual in the family home as well. We are expanding service settings to include hospitals. Now this will be contingent upon um, the policy of the hospital and whatever they are allowing and not allowing. But if you have an individual that goes into the hospital for COVID-19 or for any other reason, um, our hospital staff we know are running um, very short staffed as well. So if you have the staffing flexibility and they are uh, amenable to you providing your staff person to go into the hospital and provide support for that individual, you can bill for that time that you are with that individual in the hospital. Just work with the hospital and that will be dictated by their policy. Um, we're expanding our um, current services to include the ability to provide medical transportation. So that will no longer have to be done through the state plan and our EMS our, uh, transportation provider. You can do that and do that as an extension of a service you're already providing. So if you're providing that transportation as an ISL provider or a group home provider, you could just go ahead and do that. You, if it requires you to have to add more units, um, if, if you have to add more units, then we can increase the, the billing um, and the authorizations for that, um, for that service. If you're a DAHAB provider, you can provide the transportation and bill extra units under your DAHAB service. Um, family as caregivers, we kind of covered um, above when we were talking about residential setting, but all non-licensed waiver services may be provided by family caregivers or legally responsible relative. But again, the family member um, must be a, an employee of a DMH contracted provider so that they can um, make sure that they've got what training is necessary and doing the background check. Family transportation, waiver providers will be able to reimburse family members for providing transportation in lieu of staff providing transportation. And with that, I'm gonna turn it back over to Kim to talk about training. Yes, so we're currently working on some additional guidance that we'll be posting out on the website that will speak specifically to some of those current training requirements around CPR, first aid, and medication administration. Again, we're looking at how can we, within the current regulatory requirements at this point in time, meet the needs of the individuals to ensure their health and welfare through appropriate training of those providing care. So please stay tuned and as we mentioned earlier, make sure that you're frequently checking the website for when we're posting that additional guidance in those areas. Okay, I got a couple of questions around um, documentation. If an individual were to go home with with a family member, if the uh, if it, if you're continuing to bill for the service and you're paying that family member to provide the service, then documentation would still be required. And we we will be following up with more more specific guidance and more detailed guidance in probably virtually all of these areas um, in the days to come. So keep watching the website. Um, training, you got ed, did you cover educational yes. and staff qualifications? We're okay. We're on assessment. All right. Okay, so another thing that we're working on with our, our waiver request 
is the initial assessments for Maccabi, Vineland, and CIS will be completed through non-face-to-face -face methods, so we're expanding that, and that would include telephone or non-public face um, facing remote communication methods such as Apple FaceTime, Facebook Messenger, video chat, Google Hangouts, or Skype. But it is important to note that Facebook Live, Twitch, TikTok, and similar video communication applications are public facing and those should not be used in the provision of telehealth. For annual reassessment process, we're looking to modify to allow the completion without the need for face-to-face -face meetings and this will likely include um, revising the time frame from the two years up to three years. So continue watching for more details on that. So we know that you all are absolutely running as fast as you can to keep up with the needs of, of caring for the individuals you're serving and responding to the changes that are happening um, by the hour. And we just thank you so much for the care that you're doing and what you're doing on the front lines to, to care for the people that we all care about and support. Our job here at the division is really to try to stay out of your way as much as possible. So what we are doing there, which I think is probably weighing heavy on a lot of people's minds, is how in the world are we going to get everything authorized and approved so that we can bill it with everything moving at such a, a rapid pace. So we are putting processes in place to accept verbal authorizations if you need to change um, a setting or how you are providing a service to an individual, you're moving from day hab, your day hab service to a residential service or you're moving your staff to make that happen, you're needing to increase your hours on your ISL because the day hab is closed. Communicate that with your support coordinator. They will be in touch with um, the UR unit within the regional office and we are setting up um, an expanded UR capacity so that with delegation so that that UR staff will have the authority to approve those changes on the spot and also enter those authorizations into Seymour so that you will be able to bill those at, at when your billing cycle comes due and there will not be any delays in those authorizations. Um, Angie. Okay, so we also understand that providers are going to be retooling and repurposing their staff to meet the health and safety needs of the people that they're serving. And so we're temporarily um, suspending some of the, some of the, the reviews that, that we perform here at the division. So we're re we are temporarily suspending our TCM TAC ISP reviews, our TCM annual reviews, our provider relation reviews, components of our NCI surveys, and I'll let Kim talk a little bit more about that, and then some of our fiscal reviews. Yes, so our, our adult in-person NCI survey is a component of our quality of services review, which is one of our monitoring processes. Again, we have posted guidance around our processes that are tied to the quality of services review and our QERN nursing review processes. We will not be conducting currently the adult in-person surveys at this time. And again, all of this is to try to keep everyone healthy, safe, safe in their, their locations and and limit foot traffic as much as possible and for you to be able to, to use your staff in the best capacity that you need them. Do we need to add anything more about investigations and inquiries? Um, just real quickly on investigations and inquiries, and we have posted some information in regards to our inquiry process out on the website on our COVID-19 webpage. We did have a question that came in specifically, we are asking, and there has been guidance that, that has been sent out through your local regional offices, but we will also be posting that on our website today as well. Information, we're utilizing our Seymour EMT system, which is the system where we currently report our reportable events to track and monitor where our services are either being um, closed down, such as day programs making the determination to close, or there's a disruption in the participant or individual services. So we're asking agencies who provide these services if there is a disruption or you're closing a program to use the event reporting system as a non-reportable event so that we have the ability at the state level to track and support you and the individuals over the course of the next few weeks. We're, so be looking for that guidance that we'll be posting out on the website today. 
Another option that we have with the federal government um, is to help mitigate some losses and maintain provider stability and capacity. So we are working with the federal government on what they call retainer payments. And that's, again, just to help mitigate some of those losses with the providers, keep the stability and the capacity going. And some of those that we're looking at are um, that the state will make retainer payments available for waiver services when an individualized is hospitalized or absent from their home for a period of no more than 30 days. So that would be while the individual's in the hospital, while you're not serving them, that we would have, still have the ability to provide some financial um, funding for you. And the other one that we're working on would be another retainer payment, and that's in the event of a reduction in the billable time due to the circumstances around the COVID-19, that we can offer some supplemental funding to providers to offset the loss of revenue. Those are details that we're still working out. Um, we have a lot of collaboration going on right now with the federal federal government and other agencies to see how this will roll out and what this will look like. So you will see further, further guidance on this. And I would like to add that all of these waiver and expansions that we're, that we're doing here, these will remain in effect from the, the backdated time period that we can go to through the emergency, the COVID-19 emergency. And we will provide notification to let you know when that ends and then when it's time to begin the transition back to what I'll air quote normal life. So we'll make sure that, that we'll keep you posted on all of that. Another thing um, you should be doing is keeping detailed records and receipts of any expenditures that you have that are specifically related to COVID-19. So um, extra expenditures might include, I would, over time, um, the extra PPE, cleaning equipment, things that are over and above what you would um, need normally, things that you had to buy because of, of precautions for this exposure and this disease. And there will be a point in time down the road where you will be able to make a request for reimbursement of some of these expenses or all of these expenses. Um, so just keep detailed records because you will have to be able to document and prove that these expenditures and then um, for your request to get reimbursed for those items. And as Wendy had referenced earlier, the Department of Social Services has um, relaxed the requirements related to prescription refills and prior authorizations to ensure that individuals have essential access to their medications. We want to remind everyone to work with your local pharmacies and who you currently um, receive your medications through. And there are the recommendations that, you know, if you're needing your medications and you're considered um, concerned that you may be running out, to go ahead and be communicating with them to make the attempts to get an advancement on your medications that normally are filled. We had a question that came in about concerns if the, the government were to um, cut back on, on state staff or, or whatever, or start to close departments or whatever, if there were, was gonna be an interruption of billing. So Gary's gonna to speak to that a little bit. Hi, this is Gary Schatzmar, Deputy Director for the Division of Developmental Disabilities. So maintaining provider payments is considered an essential function. So the state, the state has, um, you know, always identified what those essential functions are in event of emergencies, and we identify essential employees. So that would be an essential function that would not be shut down. So um, that would be a high priority to maintain that, to maintain that cash flow and those payments. So I think just kind of in closing, there's a couple questions here and folks are gonna to look to see if we have other questions that come up that we haven't addressed. That we've had people that have, have written in and just concerned about um, congregate settings not downsizing or converting to alternative services and that there we've got large groups of people that are still in some day programs, maybe in some parts of the state or we're still, um, involved in community integration activities that might be in in services or areas that that aren't maybe safe or following the state and federal guidance for social distancing and all of that. We don't. We're not telling you to start or stop these kinds of services. We until the state or federal um, authority comes down and tells us that we have to close down all congregate settings and we are not able to do that. But we are asking you 
to please um, exercise good judgment, heed the precautions that are out there from the federal and state level, use social distancing. If you choose to keep your day program open, please um, follow the guidance that is out there for congregate settings and limiting the group size to 10 or less, and that includes staff. You need to ramp up all of your um, cleaning and disinfecting precautions and protocols. Uh, community integration services, you can convert those to supporting people in the home now. So you can continue to bill for those services. Um, uh, if, if they're in the home. So please be safe. I know that everybody can get stir crazy if you need to get out and, and be active, go for walks, go to the park on a picnic, um, stay away from other groups of large groups of people, um, exercise, engage in those things, but you might avoid the why and some places where um, you might be more susceptible to um, challenges with infection control. So just please, please be smart and mindful about that for your staff and for the people that, that we serve. Just got another um, thing handed to, to share that Mo Health Net is relaxing requirements related to prescription refills and prior authorizations to ensure participants have access to essential um, medications. So is that where you want? Oh, relaxing. Sorry, I missed the right note. So um, there is also a question about relaxing staff ratios. Yes, you can relax staff ratios to the extent that you're still maintaining the safety for the individuals served. And we will be putting out further guidance about how we're going about documenting those things and what will need to be put through um, on an amendment, but that would be something that you can do immediately, contact your support coordinator, and, and we'll work through the documentation part of that, just ensure that, that people are um, staying safe. We're looking at the questions here as we're, we're winding down and coming to the end. So one of the, one of the questions that we have is when will the, the retainer payments begin for day have services that have already shut down? Again, we're going to continue. We're working fast and furiously on it, trying to uh, make sure we've, we've got that system um, put in place. So we will continue to update you with that information as quick as possible. But I would say you should be prepared um, that that's not, you're not going to be receiving those payments in real time. So it's not going to be in, you know, lieu of this month's billing. So it is going to be a delay in that. We don't know how much of a delay, if it's a month or if it's three months or if it's not until this is over. So um, you just need to be um, keeping that in mind and making, taking whatever precautions you can in order to um, protect your business continuity. So uh, this is Gary. We've also been getting some questions on self-directed services, which is a little different than our provider um, um, directed services. So we are taking this memo, this guidance that went out and looking at how it applies to self-directed, specific like with the family caregiver um, retainer or um, gap payments. So we're looking at that as it applies to self-directed as well and working with Kyla Mundwiller to put together some guidance. But I know specifically uh, people have asked about the 40-hour limit, so we are working with PPL um, to get their system adjusted to take off the 40 hours. So if individuals have to cover more than 40 hours, they'll be allowed to do so. Do we have some other questions that are coming up that we want to respond to? Hang with us just a minute while we read some of the questions. Okay. So this question is, if, if I understand what was said earlier, it sounded like through another provider that has a day have, their staff can work in another provider's ISL. Yes, that is correct. The ISL is not allowing visitors during that time. How would that look and work? Well, they would only be working in that provider's ISL if that provider needed that staff coverage. 
So it wouldn't be just to add additional staff to keep a paycheck going. It would be to cover staff. So if, if that ISL or that group home or that provider doesn't have, they're fully staffed and they don't have any staffing needs elsewhere in their program, then um, I would encourage people to network with the other providers in the area. I would say and I would say staff are not considered visitors. Right, right. right. Staff would not be considered visitors. Good point. Mm -hmm. Pika, why don't you read yeah. the question? Um, so the, and some of these may have been answered in, in as I was reviewing, I might have missed the response. This question is, um, for families with med level SDS, if they want to hire a new employee, can the med administration requirement be waived as there are no classes available right now? As we mentioned earlier, and we're hoping to have this out today, is uh, additional information and guidance posted on the website around MedAid certification and recertification and how we're relaxing or providing opportunities for some of that training to be conducted via technology and online. So we'll be able to speak to that when the guidance comes out. And as I mentioned, we're pushing really hard to get that out today and posted. There will be more flexibility around the recertification than the initial certification, but then we will also be considering um, implications with self-directed services as well. Correct. Okay, so another question. Per our local pharmacy, Medicare Part D is not releasing medications early, early only Missouri Health Net. Is this correct? I, I don't know and, and can't really speak to that. What The only thing that we know is we have um, the the notice from MoHealthNet about relaxing the requirements around refills. Um, but if you're going to have to work out probably some bumps and issues with your pharmacy because of the amount of stockpile that they have on hand, and then I think issues, if you run into medication issues and questions, we would direct those to MoHealthNet. Mm -hmm. um, are there any specifics you can share with regard to the provision of employment services? That's going to be um, uh, a case-by-case -case decision if the employer is allowing the employee to rem continue to come to work and the, the individual and the team feels that that's a safe alternative for them, then that would be a team decision how to do that. The, if they um, are laid off or, or temporarily suspended in their employment, Again, the, the whoever is providing the employment supports can provide um, support to that individual in their family home or in their residential setting if that provider is needing additional support. And they can also um, do telehealth if that is, is a viable option for the individual, if it's FaceTime, if it is some queuing and prompting that way and checking in. So explore those um, remote technology options and telehealth, um, this would be a good time to, to try some of those things out. So a question, in case of staff shortage, could we hire someone without a GED? Yes, on a temporary basis. Um, you will have to, at the end of this emergency, you will have to fall into line with what the requirements of the waiver are, so it might mean that they don't have a long term. And I think that there's also, we'd have to check that there's some allowance that you have, and there's a grace period where if a person is working on their GED that they can be employed. I think we'll have to check on that. But our first priority is to keep people safe, and we have to have people in place in order to work with people and keep people safe. And in several of our services, we have the option um, that they have the lived experience. So make sure you look at your services and the, the provider qualifications because, because you would be able to hire someone in that instance if they have so many years of the lived experience. And that's in the DD Provider Waiver Manual. Can, can, guardians, um, can guardians become employees for PA services in the home? Yes. Question. When a client in an ISL is quarantined due to either a positive test or exposure, what is guidance on remaining clients and staff? 
Will the entire house be quarantined or locked down? How will we reimburse staff that need to be quarantined with clients? Again, we want to encourage everyone to be utilizing the information that we posted out on our webpage around COVID-19, the guidance from CDC around home and community-based settings. And again, that'll be. And regarding the reimbursement of your staff, that is that would be one of those expenses that you would need to keep track of for reimbursement. Um, at the end of this emergency and submit that. So until then, you would it would be a, an agency personnel expense. As I'm sure you can imagine with over 800 participants on this webinar, um, both the chat box and the Q&A box are just really piling up. Some of those questions are duplicative. So at this time, we're going to run a report and capture all of those questions and make sure that not only will we post a recording of this webinar on the COVID-19 page as well as our webinar page, um, we will also include a Q&A document follow-up. Again, um, please, please check this website frequently. Um, in addition to checking the website, if you're not signed up to receive our division email blast, we encourage you to do that. You can do that from our division homepage. There's one of the panels in our scroll bar will take you there to sign up. We are pushing out at approximately 4 o'clock each afternoon um, to um, that you'll get an update of what's been posted that day. That doesn't mean that there isn't something that will be posted after that time. Um, it just means that we're trying to capture a snapshot in time of what we posted during that time or during the day. So just in closing, um, again, we want to remind you that this is all information at this point in time and everything is changing so quickly at the state level, at the department level, and at the federal level that in, in an hour, something we said here today could be obsolete and not hold true anymore. So we are going to do our best to keep all the information updated and and do it in a way that you'll know that there was a change to this information, but just know if you hear something tomorrow, be cautious about printing stuff off uh, because if you it, that could be changed and, and you won't be sharing the um, most original and up-to-date information. So just be patient with us as we move through this time together and figure out our path. Again, we so appreciate everything you all are doing out there. We know that you are um, swamped and just working as fast as you can as well to, to respond to what the needs of the individuals are. So let us know how we can help. We appreciate the providers who have sent questions and suggestions in and let us know about changes that they're making in the program. That has also allowed us to um, incorporate those changes and have given us ideas for some of the changes that we've put in our um, request to CMS to waive some things so that we've, we're getting really good ideas from our provider network out there and um, we want to do all we can to support you. So thanks again, um, be safe, and we will talk to you next week.